our prayer tonight, to take our heart, our minds, and our will, to, to make it yours, God. As we read this morning in the one year, that that's all we have. The, the, the only hope we have is the hope of glory in you. The fact that we can actually change as human beings and change for the good. Without that, there is no hope, God. We're lost sinners on our way to destruction. And that's why we sing to you, and that's why we say yes and amen to everything you did for us, Jesus, by dying on the cross and filling us with your spirit. We thank you for that. And we thank you for your word. And I pray tonight that as Jackie teaches, that you would open up our ears, Lord. All of your scripture is, is profitable. Meet us right where we're at. Speak into our hearts and our minds, God. You know each and every heart here, and you know each and every struggle, every sin, every single thing that is wrong. And we just bring that to you, and we say, Lord, take this. Make it yours. In Jesus' name, amen. How's everybody? We are going to jump into Amos chapter 3. You ready? On your mark? All right. I'm glad you're so excited. <laughs> Being excited? Oh, jump. The jump song? <laughs> All right, Amos chapter 3. So if we remember the structure of Amos, it's going to help us understand why are we reading the book of Amos? Why are we studying books out of the Old Testament? What do, we, what do we do this for? And if you remember last time, we worked our way through the prophet Joel. And one of the things uh, that we 
challenge you with is the idea that pattern is prophecy. So we're looking at a, a real prophet who gave a real prophecy to the nation of Israel that actually came true. It happened just like he said. And it is, gives to us, as we look at it today, gives to us a distinction between how God will judge the world and how God will judge his people. And so the, it's important for us to understand. The other thing that's important is when we see patterns, like if you look at the nation of Israel in the Old Testament, and you see God coming in judgment because of certain sinful attitudes, and you wake up in the morning, and you open a newspaper, and you see those same sinful attitudes in the paper, you should see the pattern. And not assume that that means everybody has a past today. So we want to recognize, those, we, we've shared before, when we went through the book of Proverbs, Proverbs is a great book to do um, devotion with because, you know, you have 31 Proverbs, 31 days. Read a proverb a day. Boom. You got it. You got it all laid out. You got a basic plan for you as you go. But the whole point of the book of Proverbs is to give you road signs so you understand what road you're on because the Bible teaches there are two roads and two destinations. One is to be with the Lord eternally. One is to be separated from the Lord eternally. Those are two different places. Not the same place. One leads to life. The other leads to death. One is the path of wisdom. The other is the path of the fool. How do you know the difference? You have to read the street signs. How do you know what road you're on today? Because you've traveled it so long, maybe you recognize it. I know for those of us in Buell, we don't really pay attention to what a street's called. We, we turn at so-and-so's place or such-and-such -such tree or the big rock on the corner. There's a, a, lot of, a variety of a lot of ways that we may navigate. But each one of those is a, a symbol, a road sign. When the children of Israel crossed over the Jordan River into the Promised Land, God told them to go back into the river where the river was. The river was stopped up. You remember? What did he tell them to do? He said, pick up 12 stones, right? And bring a, and make a what? Make a memorial. Why are they making a memorial? Yeah, so that they can remember what happened. They're setting up a road sign. So people will know where they're at, what they're doing, where they're walking. So when Paul later on in, in Romans chapter 6 says to us, so since there is grace now, shall we sin that grace would abound? What's the answer? Certainly not. How can we who have died to sin live any longer in it? Now how do you know if you're living in sin? You look at the road signs. Well, what, what do I mean by that? The word of God. So as we're studying the word of God, there are things God's word says we don't have to ask. We know these things are things I'm supposed to stay away from. Amen? These are things that, you know, that help me understand where am I at in the road? Am I, am I moving toward the Lord or away from him? That's an important thing to understand. So as we look at the book of Amos, we remember that chapters 1 and 2 is a targeted judgment. Every single... Uh, writing prophet, so there's speaking prophets and writing prophets, right? Speaking prophets are the ones we read about, like in First, Second Kings, First, Second Chronicles, that gave prophecies to kings. You know a couple of them for sure. Elijah, Elisha. They didn't write a book, right? They were speaking prophets, and then you have writing prophets, prophets who gave prophecy, but they wrote it down. Those books we read, right? Isaiah, Jeremiah, Hosea, Joel, here we are in Amos. So he's a writing prophet who's giving, laying out a targeted response from God in judgment to the world. And he's going to circle around the nations. He does a circle that gets tighter, like a, like a funnel. And as he's going around city, 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 bang, it lands on Israel. 
So he say, and he's judging those other nations, the worldly nations, by their relationship to one another. What, what are you doing to your neighbor? If you remember when we went through those prophecies, it was like, hey, you were, you were brutal to your neighbor or you broke a treaty with your neighbor. And these were reasons for God's judgment on those nations. When he gets into Israel, what's the judgment? The judgment when God comes into Israel is, how have you, Israel, related to me? It's not about, it's no longer about the neighbors, it's how are you in, in relation to me? You and I, we have a covenant with one another. How is that covenant? And how are you in relation to my word? So ultimately, the challenge is going to be this. The challenge that Amos is bringing to Israel is this. You have acquiesced to the world. You guys know what acquiesced means? You guys all remember Pirates of the Caribbean? How does he do that line? Did you? I am disinclined to acquiesce, he says in the movie. So basically acquiesce means that you have, you've, you've been, uh, rather than being transformed to the image of God, you've been conformed into the image of this world. You become like your neighbors instead of becoming like God. So you've surrendered that. So you've acquiesced, you've surrendered that to the neighbors. You're acting like the worldly nations, okay? You've acted, you're acting like, so you don't relate to me and you're not relating to my word properly. So when the prophet would come to the people and he'd say, here's what God wants, what do the people always do? Every single prophet, it's always the same. What do they do? They ignore him. They call him crazy. They put him in a log and saw him in two. They do something. They kill the prophets all day long. And they don't respond when the word is given. So the judgment that comes to God's people is coming from a harsher place. To whom much is given. Right? So we, we come here and we see in, in Amos chapter 3, 4, 5, 6, you have <coughs> basically three sermons, three decrees, three or, 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 orations given to the nation of Israel calling them out on, on their issues. And so we'll see that today as we take a look at the decreed judgment that God gets. So let's look. Amos chapter 3, beginning at verse 1. Hear this word that the Lord has spoken against you, O people of Israel. Now listen to this. Against the whole family that I brought out. So you remember Amos is during the split kingdom, right? Right? If you've been involved in church for any given time, you may have uh, endured something called a church split, right? Where people within the church break off, go start another church, and you have two churches instead of one. Well, that happened in the nation of Israel, too. The nation of Israel split. Two tribes stayed uh, south and worshipped the Lord. Ten tribes went north to worship the gods of the other nations. But the prophecy from Amos given to Israel, the ten northern tribes, but he says this is for the whole family. I'm not just talking to the guys who are really bad. He says, I'm speaking to all of you as one family, one Israel. How many of us know there is only one church? I know there might be 7,000 denominations and different, different uh, styles of worship and different ideas about the the ordus salutis you know what that is doesn't really matter different ideas about the order of salvation what came first the chicken or the egg you know stuff like that which divide us speak in tongues don't speak in tongues uh play the drums don't play the drums you have it all right all these different divisions but there's really only one church the bible says there's only one church there is the universal church of whom jesus christ is head Right? And so the, the issue, no matter what denominational name we might fall under, is to be faithful to him. Right? Being faithful to Christ. That's what the call is, is to the church. We want to be faithful to him. And the Lord is saying through Amos, there's only one Israel. Yes, I know there's two of you. So there's twice as many kings, which means twice as much government, which usually means twice as many problems. Right? And so he's, he's laying this out. He says, oh, 
people of Israel, the whole family I brought out of Egypt, all 12 tribes, you only have I known of all the families of the earth. So I will punish you for your iniquities. The Bible tells us in Hebrews chapter 3, it says this. There's a few things out of Hebrews we're going to point to. But this one, first, he says, how, how is it that God looks to, toward the family of Israel? In Hebrews chapter 3, beginning at verse 7, listen to what it says. Therefore, the Holy Spirit says, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. On the day of testing in the wilderness, where your fathers put me to the test, they saw my works for 40 years, so I was provoked with that generation. They always go astray in their heart. They have not known my ways, so as I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. So did the initial 12 tribes of Israel enter into the promised land? Did they come into the promise? No, they, they did not enter in. Why? Because of unbelief. Because of unbelief. Even though God did all those miracles, they struggled in unbelief and weren't able to come in. And so when Amos is bringing up this concept about the families out of Egypt, it's also bringing to light their struggles, what's been a, a part of mankind. Please don't think of it as an Israel problem. Trust me, it's a Buell problem, it's a Filer problem, it's a Castleford problem, Twin Falls problem, I don't care where you live. I don't care what name you go by. We all have, we all struggle with unbelief. We all struggle with failure to trust God when we ought to trust God. And so this was a weakness within the people. And so in Amos chapter 3, verse 2, he says, so I'm going to punish you. Because what does a father do to his children? The Bible tells us a father who loves his children does what? He disciplines them. He says, if a, <laughs> he says if a father does not love his children, he'll let them do whatever they want. So we're going by bi biblical definition. So let's bring that around to the nation of Israel. Nation of Israel, whom God said, you are my child, you're my, you're my children, and they're disobedient and rebellious, what's God going to do? He's going to discipline them. He's going to bring discipline. And we know from studying the scriptures that how did God discipline them? He sent prophet after prophet after prophet. It's not like God said once. You know as parents. You have never just said one time, be quiet and go to bed or I'm going to spank you. Nobody's ever said that just once. Right? You say it over and over and over and over until finally you want to get your old carcass up and go grab the nearest stick and beat them till they're quiet. So we being evil understand some concepts of discipline. We don't get it right, but God being good knows exactly what we need. He knows exactly what's necessary. And so the Lord is saying, look, I'm going to bring what is necessary against the whole family, unified Israel. It's not just the northern tribes that are going to go to exile. South is going into exile too. North will do it to Assyria. South will go with Babylon. This is a harsher judgment than he brings to any of the other nations around him. Because to whom much is given, you, did they, nobody forced them to make a covenant with God. God came to them and said, hey, I want to make a covenant with you. And they're like, yes. When they were standing at Mount Sinai and God spoke the Ten Commandments, what did the people say? We'll go with you. We'll do whatever you say. Right? Yeah, for at least a week. So listen, here's what Amos says in verse 3. He says, do two walk together unless they have agreed to meet. Now we're going to have a series from verse 3, uh, probably is it all the way through 7. Yep, all the way through 8. We're going to have a series of statements that are cause and effect statements. So he's going to give out uh, a rhetorical question that, that is going to demand a positive response. These are not questions that will demand a negative response. We're going to say, yes, this is how it works. Yes. This is how, do two people walk together unless they have agreed to meet? Yes. That's the only way you can walk together. 
You can't walk together if you don't agree to meet. If, if you go on for a walk in Twin and I go for a walk in Buell, we did not walk together, right? So these are rhetorical questions, questions uh, designed to draw out from us uh, a positive answer, and they're all leading to the concept of cause and effect, cause and effect. So, so Amos is going to deliver these ideas of cause and effect. Do two people walk together and let's say have agreed? Um, verse uh, 4, does a lion roar in the forest when he has no prey? No, a, a, a lion roars in the forest because he has prey. He does it, a, a lion roars right before he pounces. Do you know why? Because the roar freezes the prey. So for that one instant, he roars and it, just like it would do to you and me, what would you do? You're walking in the woods and then all of a sudden you hear a roar and the next thing you see is a lion jumping at you. Yeah, oops, I should have been moving. It's, I'm too slow now, right? So this is the method. Does it, does this, is this how it works? Yes. Does a, does a young lion cry out from his den if he's taken nothing? No. He's not going to make no sounds. Does a bird fall in a snare in the earth when there's no trap for it? Does a snare spring up from the ground when it has taken nothing? You know, do, do the traps just go off by themselves? No, you have to hit the tripwire. Is trumpet blown in the city <clears throat> and the people are not afraid? Does disaster come unless the Lord has done it? So the point of all these things is there's cause and effect. When you see this, you know this is happening. You hear a lion roar, he's coming for you. When you hear a cub cry out, you know he has taken something into the den. When a bird falls to the earth, you know that he's been snared in the trap. Right? We, these are things that we understand. If someone blows a trumpet in the city, bang, the alarm is sounded. Right? There is a response that is given. And then finally he gives the phrase, can disaster come to a city unless the Lord has done it? Because of the pattern, the, the answer has to be, yes, the Lord's done it. If disaster comes to the city, yes, the Lord's done it. Now, we may not like that, but I'm pretty sure there's nowhere in the Bible that it, the Bible says, well, we'll change this because you don't like it. Right? So the Lord, the Lord ultimately is the sovereign one over all of these circumstances. And all of this is so that we can recognize and understand this truth that the Lord disciplines the ones he loves. It says in Hebrews 12, verse 5, And have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord. Don't be weary when reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves, and he chastises every son whom he receives. And so he says, it is for discipline that you have to endure. That we, you don't get to give up because you're being disciplined. You don't get to surrender. You, what you need to do is endure the discipline of God. Be corrected. What's it say in Proverbs? A fool, you will break the rod on his back and he'll never learn. But a wise man receives instruction. Wise man receives it, can take correction, can lay their pride down, can lay down all these and just respond properly. So you don't have to get hit with a two by four because the Lord will send the prophet. The word will come through a brother or sister who loves you and they will come to you and they will say, say hey, so-and-so or such and such. <clears throat> I think this is a problem. And you will go, your pride will rise up, and you will say, I can't believe they said that to me. And you need to remember what the word says. Don't, don't hate the discipline of the Lord. Now, imperfect people bring the word. I, I get it. Maybe things could be said different or done different. But you have to be able to receive correction. If you cannot receive correction, your problem is pride. And that, my friends, is one of seven things God hates. And it tops the list. 
So our pride always needs to die. Anybody ever got all puffed up because their pride rose up before they were able to push it down? For sure. Yeah, happen, it, it happens to me all the time. You know, hey, trust me, you, wanna, you want to have your pride assaulted? Become a preacher. Yeah, if you don't think everybody has an opinion about what you should have said or done, how you should have handled it, trust me, within a year or two, your, your pride is going to have so many lashes on it that uh, you should get better <laughs> at being able to receive criticism. And, and I, I always want to have a heart like David. You remember David, when Absalom is rebellion against David and David left Jerusalem, he just surrendered to capital. He doesn't want to fight his son. He doesn't want to kill his son. He surrenders the capital, and as he's leaving, there's a guy, I think his name is Shimei, something like that, and he's just cursing David up one side and down the other. And Abishai, which was one bad dude, he's part of the mighty men of David. He looks at David, and he says, David, let me go cut his head off. He literally says that. Let me go kill that guy. And David says... No. How do you know that's not the voice of the Lord? And I always held on to that. I don't always know. Now, it may, it may come to light as we continue down the road a little further, right? But I can tell you this. My snap judgments are almost 99% absolutely wrong. Right? You ever had a snap judgment that was not anywhere near the ballpark? And so... I, I want to be able to receive the correction from God from whatever voice he uses. I want to I have a heart that is willing to receive that, a humble spirit that is willing to receive that correction because I want to be corrected when God's in the talking to you phase. Because when you get to Amos, God said, I'm not talking to you anymore. When God says that the judgment is coming, he's telling them, you can't get out of it now. It's we've gone beyond the point of speaking and now we're, he's got the belt. Right? He's coming with the belt. And so there is going to be a whooping. And just like our children when they were little, they, see, my kids, I swear to you, would not go to sleep and sleep a good night's rest without being beat with a belt. My boys, they, they, I, they might as well every night have said, Dad, will you hit us with the belt first? Because they go to bed and I'd hear them in their plan. Boys, go to bed. Boys, if you don't go to bed, I'm going to come in there. You do not want me to come in there. It's time to go to bed. Every time that would get a little louder, a little louder. Then I'd even give a couple of threats like, I'm taking off my belt. And then I might smack a wall a couple of times. The belt's off. There was no shortage of warnings. By the time I walked in there, there was going to be tears, weeping, gnashing of teeth, and then there would be sleep, right? So we, we recognize this in our experience of life. And this is, this is also how God works in our life. In Romans eleven twenty seven. Here's what the Lord says through the, through the Apostle Paul. He says, that this will be my covenant with them when I take away their sins. And as regards the gospel, they are enemies for your sake. But as regards election, they are beloved for the sake of their forefathers. Why? For, because the giftings and the callings of God are irrevocable. Why do we say today God hasn't given up on Israel? Because Paul said God doesn't give up. God doesn't give up. So th there's a, a plan and a purpose, and, and much of that is in the hands of God. We trust God as he's moving forth with it, but we need to understand that judgment is also in God's hands. Is God love? Yes. And God is holy, and God is righteous, and God is just, and God is wrath. He's all of those, not 50-50. And so... If, we, if you earn the wrath of God, you earned it. He doesn't, the difference between me as an earthly father and God as a heavenly father is I lose my temper. I lose my cool. I, I would 
discipline out of anger. Now, God uses the term wrath to describe his judgment, but the word for wrath is orgy. It's a predisposed judgment. It's like, if you do A, I'm going to do B. And then you do A, and he does B. And then it's hard to look at God and say, why'd you do B to me? I told you. If you do A, right? So we need to understand the truth of of these things. He goes on now in uh, Amos 3, 7. For the Lord God does nothing without revealing his secret to his servants, the prophets. There's always God's call to repentance before judgment falls. Always. Always the call to repent. Always the call to turn. The proclamation of the message that the Lord gave to the prophets <clears throat> was the very basis of the prophet's authority came from standing in the counsel of God. You have at least two, probably three, maybe more, if I think about it, pictures about how does the counsel of God work. There's, there's at least three pictures, right? In the year that King Uzziah died, Isaiah said, I saw the Lord high and lifted up. He had a face-to-face -face interaction with God. Ezekiel chapter 1, Ezekiel sees... God coming on the throne chariot to talk to him, to commission him. And we, we read about, it, I want to say in 2 Kings, 1st or 2nd Kings, we see another example where God is in the council and he is given the prophets the call to go and do what, what there are to do for the Lord. So that's a prophet. <clears throat> Today, people go, people just try to assume that authority. You can speak for God. Every time I stand up here and I read scripture, I'm prophesying, right? Because prophecy is not always foretelling, it's forthtelling. It's saying, what has God said? What we need to be careful of is people who assume God's authority. The Bible says at the end of the book of Matthew, Jesus said, all authority has been given to me in heaven and earth, right? He commissioned us, go and make disciples, so now when we prophesy, we prophesy by reading or speaking or sharing the written word of God with others. That's what prophecy is. And should the Lord reveal something to you, that's great. We Dreams and visions, we believe that. <clears throat> but you don't have the authority of a prophet anymore. If you walk in here and take off all your clothes and stand naked like Isaiah did and say, the Lord told me to do this, we're going to kick you out. I'm going to say no. So don't do it. The prophets in the Old Testament were given the authority that God gave them, and they were able to do things, right? They were able to do things. We see miracles coming through their hands, and they had authority. If you didn't listen to the prophet, <clears throat> Deuteronomy 18, Moses speaks <clears throat> of the coming of Jesus, and he says, there's a prophet coming like me, he's going to come later on. And when he comes, you better listen to every word he says. Because his words are life. So the, the added, that's it. Jesus has come. Amen? Amen? So we're not looking for another prophet. In fact, in the book of Revelation, when we hear about two guys that act like prophets, what does the Bible call them? Witnesses. Two witnesses. Amen? Because the, Jesus, John the Baptist is the last prophet, Old Testament prophet. Jesus Christ is the end of the prophets. So we, we're not looking for another with the authority like an Old Testament prophet. I'm not saying someone can't prophesy. I'm saying the office is gone. We, you don't have the authority to tell someone else what God wants them to do. Amen? Because God will speak to us, won't he? Okay, so he goes on. And he declares, then, the lion has roared. Who shall not fear? The Lord God has spoken. Who can but prophesy? So God, Amos is saying, God told me what to say, and I'm going to tell you. The lion is roaring. We started that way in chapter 1, and now the lion, he is roaring again. Verse 9. <clears throat> Proclaim to the strongholds in Ashdod and to the strongholds in the land of Egypt and say, 
Assemble yourselves on the mountains of Samaria and see the great tumults within her and the oppressed in her midst. They do not know how to do right, declares the Lord. They store up violence and robbery in their strongholds. So the Lord is calling the other nations to witness. So he says to them, come and look. Come on the mountaintops over Samaria, that's the northern kingdom, and look down at what they're doing. There are people being oppressed in her midst. They don't know the difference between right or wrong. And they are storing up violence and robbery. In Revelation, it uses this phrase. They are storing up wrath. In fact, in the book of Revelation, you have bowls full of wrath, right? That are being poured out. And that's wrath in the response to the wickedness of the people. So the Lord is saying here to them, look, look, here's what's wrong. They are, they are oppressing their neighbor, their brother, their, their sister. They're oppressing one another. They don't know what's right. Why don't they know what's right? Do they have the word of God? Israel, does Israel have the word of God? For sure. Do they have prophets? For sure. Are they speaking? They are. So why doesn't she know what to do? Because she is rebellious. She has chosen to rebel, to turn her back. In the book of Proverbs, she is called the immoral woman. The rebellious woman. They don't know how to do right. They are plundering and looting one another. And so they are storing up the storehouse is full of wrath. And God will grant grace and mercy and time while he calls for repentance. But eventually, the storehouse is full. And when the storehouse is full, God's judgment will come. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, verse 11, An adversary shall surround the land and bring down your defenses from you, and your strongholds will be plundered. So what you're doing to one another is going to be done to you. And the Lord says, as the shepherd rescues from the mouth of the lion two legs and a piece of ear, what can you do with two legs and a piece of ear? Will it live? So the point that the Lord is making is, so shall be the people of Israel who dwell in Samaria. There's no rescue. There'll be pieces left like a lion tearing apart a lamb. The northern kingdom, when, when they go into captivity, there's no return. Now, it doesn't mean everybody dies. We, we know that they carry them to captivity. Some will die. Some will be transported from here to there. And the Bible said that would happen. The people of God would be scattered to four corners of the earth. And there would also be a day when God would do what? He would bring them back. Okay? Okay. So this is what's going on. They're being scattered. There's nothing left. Samaria will end. There will be nobody there anymore. Nobody there until the children of Israel return from Babylon. And then those people who went to Babylon will re-inhabit the area of Samaria and the nation of Israel. So, so shall the people of Israel that dwell in Samaria be rescued with the corner of a couch or part of a bed. So it's just everything. There's no, the point is there's not a rescue. There will be absolute plunder, complete. It's the end of the nation. Not the end of every individual. It's the end of a nation. This nation's coming down. You, you don't have the right to be a nation anymore. Then he goes on, verse 13. Hear and testify against the house of Jacob, declares the Lord God, <clears throat> the God of hosts. On that day... I punish Israel for his transgressions. I will punish the altars of Bethel, and the horns of the altar will be cut off and fall to the ground. If you go to Israel with us in a couple of years when we go back to Israel, we're going to travel to Dan, which is the northernmost tribe. And in Dan, there is the site of an altar where one of the golden calves were that Jeroboam brought in for false worship. Now, there's no golden calf there anymore. God said, I'm going to wipe it out. 
The place where the golden calf was is there. And so you can see where, where they had set up the altars of false worship and where these things were going to be judged. God's going to do what is necessary. He is going to abolish idolatry in Israel. The altars of Bethel are brought down. There's one in Bethel in the south and one in Dan in the north. And the Lord is going to take them both down. <clears throat> Verse 15, and I will strike the winter house and the summer house. The houses of ivory will perish. The great houses will come to an end, declares the Lord. So I'm going to get the summer house and the winter house. So the idea is in Israel, in the northern kingdom, they were enjoying a time of great affluence. Maybe some of us have a winter home and a summer home. But I'm going to go so far as to say none of us have a house made of ivory. And the reason the Bible uses this phrase, it's, it's talking about the opulence, the wealth that they had piled up. When you read Ezekiel, one of the charges <clears throat> that Ezekiel brings to the southern kingdom is you're like Sodom and Gomorrah. You have fullness of food, idleness of time, and you don't care about the poor. You have all this wealth and all these things are yours, but <clears throat> you've spent them all on you. And God says, I'm taking it all because it's all his. You and I don't have anything that God hasn't given us. And so the Lord, in this case, the Lord says, I'm taking it away. Solomon had an ivory throne. But Samaria is boasting ivory houses. So it is a statement of the luxury and self-indulgence and ultimately the immoral practices that come because you're living the good life. Does that remind you of anybody? <clears throat> the... Matt Walsh did a documentary. You guys, if you've not seen it, you should see it. It's worth watching. It's called What is a Woman? Um, there's a part of that documentary where he goes to a tribe in Africa. And he asks them about all these questions about the transgender troubles and LGBTQ issues and all these things that we've been dealing with of late, right? Seems like it's picking up speed faster and faster. Yeah. You know what the tribe in Africa said? Yeah, we don't have time for that. We got to get food. We got to gather water. We've got to have children so that we survive. So they have none of it. Because those problems are only problems that come to the affluent, to the wealthy. Actually, those kind of problems came to the nation of Rome just before the nation of Rome became nothing because they had time, money, plenty of food. You know, for most of us nowadays, none of us are going, oh my gosh, I didn't get the crops in in time. Unless you're a farmer, which could happen here. But most of us, where we get our food? What is the store? And most of, the world, most of the United States, how do they do it? Well, if I'm hungry, I go to the store. Yeah. They're totally detached from the reality of what it takes to have food. Right? So here in Amos, you can see an incredible pattern for the northern kingdom of Israel, their wealth, the struggles that they had, the immorality that they practiced, the idolatry that they had. And I can definitely see a pattern. Now, I'm not telling you Amos is for us. I'm just saying we are acting like Israel as a nation. So <clears throat> we probably shouldn't expect something else. Right? I know sometimes I'd be at home and I'm a, I'm a young kid and I was the most obedient of all my brothers. <clears throat> so maybe my dad went into my other brother's room and spanked him and put him to bed. And of course, I learned. 
So the next night when dad was saying the same things to me, I was going to receive the same action. Right? So what that should enable the faithful to do, it should enable the faithful to sh share the truth. There's no reason to die or people to perish or people to get stiff necks and buck against whatever comes, whatever it looks like. If, if the, most of the world goes through times of famine, we think somehow we're better than everybody else. We won't ever be hungry. You think you won't see empty shelves? Well, there was empty shelves of toilet paper a while ago. What about the baby, um, what was it, formula? Oh, in, in where? In the United States? Oh, you're crazy. Is there wars out there? Is there rumors of wars? Are there guys making crazy threats? Shaking nuclear weapons up in the air? Hmm. A lot of pattern there. Now, the Lord tells us these things so that we can know, so that we can, I'm, I'm not saying be a prepper, go put a bunch of food in your, get a bunch of guns, get ready. What I am saying is, in those times when that happens, there is always a great harvest of souls. Because in those days, men will lift their heads up to see where their help comes from. Amen? Amen. And we have the ability to help. We want to be able to respond. We want to have, be in a right relationship with God. Ask the Lord for favor so that we might be able to minister to those around us who may be having a harder time. So that God will be glorified. Amen? Why don't you stand with me and let's pray. <clears throat> Father God, we thank you for the truth of your word. God, as your word comes to us, we want to be men and women who will hear what James had to say. Men and women who are willing to respond to what God has declared. That we want to be who you're calling us to be. We want to be not those who are hearers only, but doers also. That we might respond to all that you are are calling us to God we want to do and act and be like those who will glorify you in those in the things that we do Lord we want to honor you we want to see you um, magnified in every way that we can we thank you God that you are still moving we find ourselves in a nation deserving of judgment but judgment hasn't come yet and while that doesn't mean that it won't come it does mean we have time. Today is the day of salvation. Now is the time when we may trust in God that he is able to deliver us from the guttermost to the uttermost. So, Lord, I just pray that you would <coughs> move among us, through us, in us. Lord, that we would not follow the pattern of those who hear your challenge is and then don't learn but rather God we would be of those who hear your word and we respond that we would be obedient to your call and that we would be ready to give an answer for the hope that is within us so we give you praise Lord for it all in Jesus name amen
Christ our Lord. Be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time. And here today, you for who you are you are worthy lord may we put our faith and trust in you may you guide us and lead us these days that we would have like the men of issachar we would know what is necessary and that we would be faithful to do it we give you praise in jesus name amen god bless you guys We're tearing down all the chairs. We're tearing down the chairs. Just take them all. Don't listen to Kathy. Well, you three rows then. No.